and hello friends, Slomo Phillips here from allfaith.com. Those of you who are watching me live on Facebook will probably be aware of the fact that you had a hard time hearing me a moment ago when I did this broadcast live. That's because my microphone was not in front of my face where it's supposed to be. I actually noticed it during the closing song. I apologize for that. So, um, we're going to do it again. <laughs> this may be uh, a little bit different, but the source material is going to be the same. If you'd like to hang out and watch, I encourage you to do that. If you have any questions or comments, I invite you to post them in the chat screen. Um, by the way, if you ever notice that you're having a problem hearing me, feel free to post it on the thing and say, hey, I can't hear you. Because <laughs> I, it's actually sort of funny. I commented on the last video that I'm not very tech savvy. <laughs> I think I just proved it to everybody. So anyway, we're going to begin this thing again. Here we go. Thank you for your patience. All right. Um, so what we're talking about today is the counting of the Omer. What is an Omer? And why do we keep counting it? We've been counting the thing for 5,000 years. You'd think we'd have it by now. But we keep counting it over and over every year. Why do we keep doing that? Let's find out. During this broadcast, boy, I'm, I'm sort of comical. When I make a, a big mistake like this, I just sort of laugh at myself and <laughs> have a hard time being more serious. Um, if you have any questions or comments, though, do post it to the chat screen. I'll be happy to comment on it when I can. Uh, which will be during the broadcast sometime. If you're watching this live, you'll have a chance to do that. So counting the Omer, this is a piece that I wrote on April 14th, 2015. Uh, during the Festival of the Omer, each year I post the counting of the Omer live on my Facebook wall. I'm doing it again this year. can't say I'll do it next year, but my intention is to keep doing this every year. The Omer will be posted to my Facebook wall somewhere around sunset, um, during the 49 uh, days, or 49 evenings, actually. So the counting of the Omer is actually a biblical command. Most Jewish holidays and most Jewish practices are biblically based. Uh, that's because the Bible is our foundation stone, and of the Bible, or the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Torah is the heart of it. This is a Torah command. It's also one of the 613 commands. Uh, in the average listing of the 613 commands, commandments, which uh, I use, and I think most people do these days, you'll find it is, is a mitzvah number 127. To count 49 days from the time of the cutting of the omer, or the first sheaves of barley harvest, there are various counts, as I said, to the omer, but generally speaking, you're going to find this one at 127. The Torah says at Leviticus 23, 15, and 16, And you shall count for yourself from the morrow of the rest day, from the day that you bring the omer as a wave offering, seven weeks. They shall be complete. You shall count until the day after the 70th week, namely the 50th day, on which you shall bring a new meal offering to the Lord. That's Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 and 16. We know that we have biblical commands that we don't always necessarily understand how to do. That's why we have the oral law. The oral Torah tells us how to do these biblical commandments. Chabad gives us a lot of insights into the counting of the Omer, as they do on many topics. Here's what Chabad says on this particular subject. From the second night of Passover, which is today as I'm recording this, until the day before the holiday of Shavuot, that's when the Torah was given, the Jewish people engage in a unique mitzvah called Sifarat HaOmer, or the counting of the Omer. The Torah commands us that during this time, each year, we are to count seven complete weeks for a total of 49 days. At the end of the seven-week period, we celebrate Shavuot, which means weeks. This is considered to be a mitzvah. So the count, which takes place each evening, is preceded by a blessing. Uh, this is me. When you're going to do a mitzvah, you always like to do a blessing first. However, continuing, 
we may recite the blessing only if we have not missed a single day's counting. If we have omitted the counting of even one night during that stretch, proceeding to the point when we missed it, in other words, and did not make up for it during the daytime without reciting the blessing, we may no longer recite the blessing, but instead we must listen as a friend recites the blessing, and then we do the counting. I don't know if you know this or not, but anytime you hear someone doing a blessing, you can always say Amen to chime in to the blessing. Traditionally, Jews don't say Amen to their own prayers. Amen is sort of like an I agree with you. It's sort of, you don't really say, you know, may you this happen, I agree with me, may this happen. So Jews don't usually say Amen to their own prayers. But when you hear someone else reciting a blessing, you can always say Amen. Ahuva, would you mind getting me some water? So when you're doing the counting of the Omer, if you miss a day, you can make up for it the next day, and then you can continue your count. But if you don't make up for it before the next time for counting comes up, you're not allowed to say the blessing anymore after that because you have not recited them all. So let's continue with Chabad. Why do we count these days? We learn several reasons. The foremost is that the count demonstrates our thrill for the impending occasion of receiving the Torah, celebrated on Shavuot. Just as a child will often count the days until the end of school or of an upcoming family vacation, so too we count the days to show our excitement at again receiving the Torah, as we do in fact receive the Torah in a renewed sense every year. We also learned that this period is meant to spiritually prepare and refine ourselves. When the Jewish people were in Egypt nearly 3,400 years ago, they assimilated many of the immoral ways of the Egyptian people, parentheses by me, just like today we have assimilated and we have adopted many of the uh, spiritual defilements of Western societies. So we're in the same situation in some ways as those Jews who were in Egypt. Continuing, the Jews had sunk to an unprecedented level of spiritual defilement. They were on the brink of destruction. But at the last possible moment, the children of Israel were miraculously redeemed. They underwent a spiritual rebirth and they quickly ascended to the holiest collective state that they had ever reached. They were so holy, in fact, that they were compared to angels when they stood at the foot of Mount, Zion, of Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. It was during that 49-day period that they underwent such radical transformation from the lowest lows to the highest heights in just seven weeks. The commandments of the Torah are not meant merely as our history, but instead they represent our ongoing life lessons for every Jew. We learn the Torah as freshly received every day of our lives, and we approach it and its commandments with the appropriate vigor. So too, we must digest the lesson of the counting of the Omer, it is specifically during this time period that we strive to grow and to mature in our spiritual state. The Torah was not, uh, rather the Torah does not allow us to become satisfied with our current level of spirituality. Instead, it tells us to set ever higher goals for ourselves and to then methodically strive to reach that goal. The growth that occurs during this time is akin to a marathon. We pace ourselves and we seek to improve ourselves day by day until finally we reach the day when we again receive the Torah. In this process, we look deep within ourselves and we work on all of our negative attributes. If we are challenged, for instance, in the realm of kindness, then we go out of our way to do charitable acts. If we're lacking in an area of justice, then we hold ourselves to the highest possible standards while exacting and demanding in our personal behavior and our habits, justice. And so it goes for all of our trades. This is paraphrasing, or actually it's a quote, from 
Yerahim Elfort. So, this is me. So, the period of the counting of the Omer, the purpose of it is to remember a historic event. But more than that, it's to honor the earth from which we receive the grain that sustains our life. But more than that, the Omer tells us to look deeply within ourselves, within our own consciousness, to purify ourselves. During the holy period uh, just prior to, um, to the Day of Atonement, we look outward from ourselves to our neighbors and to our fellows, and we apologize if we have wronged anyone. We try to make up for any short and slight comings that we've had with other people in our dealings with people. We try to seek the forgiveness of other people, knowing that through that process, we'll receive the forgiveness of Hashem. This time of year, however, it's different. Because here in the springtime of the year, we're looking within ourselves. We're looking within ourselves to try to figure out how to purify ourselves. We count the Omer as a way to purify our consciousness, as we'll discuss in a few minutes. So this is very different. It's also important to realize that the rabbis teach us we should not say, as God gave Torah to our ancestors. Rather, we should say, as God gave me the Torah. We discussed that on my, um, on my video for Pesach. When you're telling the story during the Seder of the, um, of the exodus from Egypt and the giving of the Torah and whatnot, you tell your children that in this way Hashem redeemed me. Hashem led me from slavery. We personalize the experience of the exodus. And the same way with the counting of the Omer, we are counting the Omer for ourselves, not just as a historic memory. Now we have the question, what is an Omer? Uh, Zohar Prince de Leon is with us and says, I love this man. Thank you, uh, Zohar. I'm glad that you're here. So now we're going to look at the question, what is an Omer? Well, basically an ancient an omer is an ancient Hebrew dry measurement. It's the tenth part of an ephah. This would be considered about 3.64 liters or 3.8 U.S. quarts. An omer is also a sheaf of corn or an omer of grain presented as an offering on the second day of Passover, which is today as I'm recording this. The period of the 49 days between the second day of Pesach or Passover and Shavuot or Pentecost. So Judaism, like I think all ancient religions for the most part, has a really solid agrarian or agricultural foundation. As you probably know, Jews don't hunt. We don't take our guns and go out and hunt animals for food. But we do go out and raise crops. We're very agrarian people. And so by counting the Omer, it reminds us of our relationship to the earth. It reminds us that the earth is what feeds us, that the earth is where we get our food from. And we take the Omer from the earth and we bring it to Hashem and sacrifice. So too, we take the Omer of our own consciousness and we offer that to Hashem. The counting of the Omer, therefore, has many deeper levels of meaning. Now, as many of you know, I am very reticent to discuss Jewish mysticism on the Internet. There are many reasons why I just really flatly refuse to go into Jewish mysticism on the Internet. Among those is that people who are advanced enough to be qualified to delve into Jewish mysticism are not, generally speaking, the people who come to my Facebook page with questions about Jewish mysticism. Because to properly study Jewish mysticism, you have to be studying, un you're supposed to be studying under an accomplished Jewish mystic. So if such a person had a question about such sensitive topics, they would go to their instructing rabbi or their instructing teacher. Jewish mysticism is very powerful, and it is easily misunderstood, as we'll speak as we continue on here. But for the counting of the Omer, it is important that I delve into this just a little bit. 
So to begin, there are four worlds. We call them worlds in English. Works as good as anything else. Our physical world, the world that we live in, the world that we can sense with our senses, consists of two components, those being the celestial and the terrestrial. The celestial includes the stars and the planets, the physical heavens. The terrestrial is our realm, the physical earth. When you combine the celestial and the terrestrial, together they comprise our physical world. What we can see with our eyes and touch with our hands, including what we can find through telescopes and space exploration. In our pride, we usually think that our world is endless and supreme, but in truth, our world, including the farthest reaches of space as we know it, are only minor realms within the limitless expanse of existence. Whether you're talking a person who's simply egotistical or you're talking about an expert scientist or philosopher, um, people who think they've got a handle on it. They look at the ancient world's scientific knowledge, medical knowledge, and think, oh, those people were idiots. We understand. You don't understand squat. No one has any knowledge before Hashem. No one has any knowledge of anything that really matters. Because beyond us, reality opens up in ways that we can't even comprehend. Hoover, did you say that somewhere? In ways that we can't even comprehend. I apologize for that. You were having a little bit of matzah here. <laughs> I kept elbowing my plate. Um, so when we say above... We're referring to above our realm as though it was above us, but we know now that the world is actually round. In fact, the Torah, by the way, says that. It wasn't news to the Jews when the, when the Europeans discovered that. But um, so above us could actually be below us because we're on a round or an oval rotating ball. So, but you know what I mean when I say above. I'm just pointing this out so people don't say, well, there's really no above. You're right. There's not an above. But above our realm is the world of the angels and similar entities. This realm, this second world, is much larger than our world and higher and more expansive than that is the third world, which is the realm of the higher forces. This is known as the world of the throne or the Merkaba or the chariot throne. It was referenced by Prophet Ezekiel in chapter 1 of his book, the book bearing his name. This level of, really, of reality is beyond anything that we can actually conceive. And yet Hashem gives us ways that we can even try to conceive that. Prophet Ezekiel is the only biblical prophet who actually describes the mechanics <clears throat> of his revelation, of his realization, of his visionary state, as he describes the Merkaba in the first chapter of Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel describes this in human terms that he could sort of get a handle on. But even his realization transcended his ability to understand and properly share. The symbolism of Ezekiel chapter 1 is the foundation stone of Merkaba meditation, Merkaba mystical studies in Judaism and is a foundational principle of many forms of Jewish mysticism. So understand that the worlds above ours are all teeming with diverse entities, for lack of a better word, with individualized life. Torah says that humanity is the highest. We're the highest creation because we're given this freedom of choice and because Hashem has blessed us in unique ways. But we are not alone in the multiverse, so to speak. There are many, many, many life forms beyond our comprehension in higher realms than we are. And higher still than that realm is the realm that can only be called a world in a general sense because we don't have anything better to call it. Even the Hebrew reveals that we don't have really a suitable word. This realm transcends all description and it encompasses 
realities that we can only speak of in philosophical or allegorical terms because that reality is so far beyond our finite comprehension, we simply cannot even hazard a guess as to what it's like beyond using allegorical terms. This is the realm of divine influences that emanate from the Holy One, blessed be He. In this realm, to help us get a handle, the Torah often will use courtly language. We think of Hashem as a king sitting on a throne with his court administrators around him. But understand, this is a metaphor. Hashem has no physical form, but we need help to be able to get a handle on understanding this. These are the revelations or emanations of Hashem's divine light from which everything exists and comes into being. This is the world of God. Although, again, the term world doesn't really apply in any practical sense because there is absolutely no place that is devoid of Hashem's active presence. The influences that emanate from the Holy One, blessed be He, cannot be considered as entities, nor are they distinguishable in any way. These are not individual phenomena, individual existences. Rather, we might consider them to be spectrums of the Or Hadash, or the sacred light, that emanates from the Holy One, blessed be He, according to His will. So, we're not talking about ten separate beings. We're talking about light spectrums, and we're trying to do it in a way that we can get our consciousness around. Through these spectrums of sacred light, the Holy One bestows all of existence, both the particular and the universal, to the creatures according to their diverse natures, which are according to His creative designs. Understand that not all realms are the same and that not all entities are the same. We in the West tend to speak of individual rights to equality. Individual rights and equality don't quite mesh because each individual is unique. We have three dogs and each of these three dogs have very different personalities. They all have the right to eat when we feed them and they all have the right to do what we decide to allow them to do, but they're not the same. They're not equal in any kind of a real sense. So too the creatures, Hashem has determined each of us, our nature, our life choices that we're permitted to have within the confines of His will. Hashem provides to each being according to its own nature and according to its needs through the emanations of his light, light being singular here. On this chart, you will see a slight physical example of what I'm talking about. You will see that there are the ten emanations, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then here is Da'at, and we're not going to discuss Da'at, in fact, we're not going to actually get into any of these individuals, but these are the ten Sephirot here in the Tree of Life that we're going to be talking about. These emanations, therefore, are one. They are not separate entities. And yet, they can be categorized or conceptualized, just like music can be conceptualized as being one, and yet music consists of diverse notes that are played. Kabbalists and Jewish mystics are experts at playing these diverse notes to create celestial music. Related to this concept is the ten utterances that are referred to in the first chapter of Bereshit or Genesis. You recall there that Hashem said, let there be and there was. There are ten of these divine utterances. The graphic that I'm showing you now on the screen has the Sadiq. The Sadiq is a pious person. The Sadiq is pondering the Torah scroll in his hand, 
And through the Torah scroll, he is realizing the microcosm and the macrocosm of all of existence. These are the ten emanation or sephirot, sephirot of his own being. This is conceived of in other terminology as the palace or the house of Adam Cadman or the original primordial man, not to be confused with Adam in the book of Genesis. Adam Cadman is humanity and its potential. It is material existence and its potential. By actualizing the individual emanations on the tree of life, we're able to climb higher and higher as we gradually align ourselves more and more completely with the Holy One. Blessed be He. Just as there are four worlds, so too there are four trees, or four of these, uh, these structures that I showed you a moment ago. As one spiritually ascends or progresses along his spiritual path, Kether becomes Malkut of the next order. What does that mean? If you look on your screen, you should be able to see me circling the top sephirot. This is Kether. This on the bottom is Malkut. Malkut is our realm, our world. A person who climbs up this tree passes through the ten sephirot until they attain to Kether. Kether then will flip, and Kether becomes Malkut of the next order, and the person continues to climb. So in other words, the person is always advancing, is always climbing higher and higher up Jacob's ladder, so to speak, towards the attainment of Hashem. And the process towards enlightenment, or at one minute with the divine light, of the, or Hadash, progresses endlessly as we become ever more attached to the Holy One, blessed be He, who alone is our source and our destination, as you read in Tehillim Psalms 82. This process is what's being referred to in the counting of the Omer. As, for instance, on day three of week two of the count, we have Tiferet in Guvora, which is the personal unification of these emanations. Now, again, this is complicated material, but as you go through the count, and I'll explain specifically more about that as we continue, but as you go through the count, you are purifying your own inner being, your own nature, to draw closer to Hashem. Again, during Rosh, Rosh Chodesh, uh, uh, Yom Kippur, rather, the Day of Atonement, you're looking outwardly for purification, forgiveness from others. For this, you're looking inward for purification to purify yourself. Now, having, I hope, presented this basic material in a way that you can understand, I also have to offer you this serious warning. There is a vast wealth of wisdom and potential in studying Jewish mysticism and the topics related to it. There's also a serious potential of danger. Just as religions and diverse sects of replacement theologies have arisen seeking to replace the Jewish people and hoping to usurp the Jewish covenant with Hashem, so too there are a lot of counterfeit groups selling Kabbalah by various names. These groups you want to avoid at all costs, in my humble opinion. The real knowledge of these topics come with strict rules about teacher and student qualifications, applications, and so on. The websites they're claiming to be teaching historic or New Age or practical Kabbalah are not to be trusted. To study these ancient Jewish topics, one needs to be Jewish. This is not intended for the other nations, and one must be very well versed in the Torah and the Tanakh, the Mishnah, the entire Talmud, and so on. Plus, one needs to be Torah observant and to be regularly engaging himself or herself in hit bodedut or personal secluded prayer time with Hashem. One needs to be learning one-on-one -on -one, or maybe in a small group 
with a well-trained Rav who is experienced and knowledgeable in these topics and who possesses the applicable traits. On the internet, you will find a lot of information about Kabbalah. Some of it is accurate. A lot of it, frankly, is poison. A lot of it, if you actually manage to get the commitment to attain it, will actually be spiritually destructive to you. Proper training in these ways is required. And most Jews, even many rabbis, are not qualified to teach this topic. This will negate virtually anything that you find on the internet. I want to be clear about that. There's a couple of better sources online. Chabad has a really good Kabbalah online site. But please understand that this is not a field to be lightly dallying with. My personal suggestion, focus on the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Focus on the teaching of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Focus on the teaching of established rabbis who share with you. Rebbe Nachman includes a lot of material in his teaching that is Kabbalistic in its source material and stories that will present these truths in ways that are uplifting and beneficial to your spiritual development. But going into these areas unqualified or through an unqualified teacher is dangerous. Counting the Omer, by the way, is a Jewish-only obligation. So if you're not Jewish, I'm not saying you can't count, but you're not commanded to count. There's no law saying that you have to account. This counting is specifically for the Jews. No one is going to look over your shoulder and say, you're not supposed to be counting that. <laughs> but the command, biblically, is only for Jews. It begins on the second day of Pesach. Now, to understand the tree of life, to understand this level of spiritual reality, there's a concept called Ein Sof that needs to be understood. Hi, Pesach, glad you're here. There's a concept that needs to be understood referred to as Ein Sof. So here's a general understanding from a piece that I wrote February 11th, 2014. According to the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, the God of Israel is Echad. In other words, he is completely and totally, indivisibly one. This oneness is sometimes referred to as Ein Sof. There actually exists nothing but Ein Sof, nothing but the eternal one, the no thing. In other words, no definable thing. Hashem is not this, Hashem is not that. Ein Sof is beyond all conception. Ein Sof is the focus of Jewish mysticism. Ein Sof is the one beyond all conception. There is no second to compare to the Holy One, as you read in Isaiah 46.5. As the Shema informs us, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hear Israel, Hashem is our God. Hashem is one. The Eternal One is Echad, absolutely one. This oneness is absolute and unchanging. This truth reveals to us that Ein Sof is not part of a trinity, nor a pantheon of gods, nor is he it composed of a trinity, nor a pantheon of gods. Everything that exists arises from the will of the Eternal One. Therefore, Ein Sof is not a cosmic unconsciousness like the Force in Star Wars, Star Wars. Since the Eternal One manifests desire, personality, and demonstrates concern for the creation. Now, as I said, when we're talking about, when we're trying to conceive of the four worlds, we are taught to think of Hashem in a courtly setting where Hashem is the king seated upon a throne and we are approaching his throne with humility. But that is a metaphor. That is an allegory. Hashem has no body. Hashem is not sitting on a throne. Hashem is everywhere. According to our sages, the creation began with the bringing forth of the ten sephirot. These can be thought of as building blocks 
or as divine energy emanations. Again, these are the sephirot on your screen. I'm circling them with my mouse. This conception, as the rabbis began understanding it, led to some confusion. People who were trying to grasp the inconceivable nature of this determined that the ten sephirot must be gods, or manifestations like the Baals or the demigods, but this simply is not so. There is no god with God, as it says at Deuteronomy 32:39. This is a good example of how easily one can be led into error. It makes sense to think of these as like demigods, but it is not correct. One must properly understand the Torah to avoid such confusion. One must properly be taught by masters in the arts of Jewish mysticism, one-on-one, -on -one, personally, in order to avoid confusion. So, with the creation, or in the beginning, Ainsof is partially revealed as the Elohim. So remember you had Ainsof, and then you had the Or Hadash coming into the void. That we can conceive of as Elohim, the conceivable God over all gods. There is a mistaken idea that since Elohim, the word, is a plural noun, it means that there are more than one God. Christians often like to point to this to say that that's a trinity. However, this plural noun is always presented in a singular form. And when it says Elohim created, it then says thus did God, singular. So Elohim is the God of all gods. There are no other gods. But in the ancient world, people conceived of many gods. Today, we still conceive of many gods. We just call them cars or money or wealth. But people conceived of many gods. And so the point was that if you want to believe in many gods, knock yourself out. But God, Hashem, Elohim, is the God over all gods. This is what Elohim refers to. I spoke about this in a previous talk. From Elohim, the creator, came forth, comes forth, all existence, other than Ainsof, of course, who has neither beginning nor end. Creation, or concept of time where beginning or end would even be applicable. Creation emerges from the oneness of the Ainsof, from the void that was established for this purpose. All of our world, the first world, all of it exists within this void. Without, in any way, infringing on the Akkad, or singular nature, of the Eternal One. And this, again, is difficult to conceive, and is again why it is important to have a qualified instructor with you, personally, physically, not on the Internet, to help you conceive of these things. This calling forth by Hashem produces Adam Kadman, the Tree of Life, Primordial, primordial man, existence. Now, don't be confused here. Again, this is not the Adam Cadman from this is not the Adam rather from the Garden of Eden, but Adam Cadman is sort of a prototype of existence, within which resides all potentiality. Through this coming into existence, the ten sephirot or the emanations of the One manifest. With the coming forth of these ten emanations, the creation takes the form and boundaries within time and space. Hashem, Ainsof, has no boundaries, and time and space have no existence. The terms, the realities, have no meaning for Ainsof. But that which is within time and space is infused with independent life, by the will of our Creator. In truth, however, there exists nothing except the Ainsof. What is created as a separate existence from the Ainsof, those created things, especially humans, 
primarily humans as far as we know, through immuna or active faith and trust and humility are able to attain spiritual harmony with the Holy One. This is the path of the Tzadikim, the righteous people. They exercise their imuna as fully as they possibly can, and their righteousness helps them attain a level of oneness with Hashem that most of us can only dream for. But understand that all of these all of these sages, all of these people like Rebbe Nachman, like Lubavitcher Rebbe, like so many of these great Sadakim, they're just like me and you. The difference is they decided to apply themselves through their amuna to understanding, to grasping, and to achieving harmony with Hashem. You can do this. I can do this. But will we? This is another area where confusion very easily develops. When you say that there exists nothing except for Ein Sof, some people will try to compare that to certain teachings and other religious traditions, other spiritual traditions. This Hasidic concept of Ein Sof, of the oneness of the creation with the Creator, is not the same thing as the Eastern or Indian concept of Nirguna Brahman, wherein the diverse parts, Atman, collectively form the totality, para Atman, of the whole. And hence, in their belief systems, they cry, Tatvamasi, thou art that. This is not the same teaching. Because Ein Sof exists completely independent from the creation. The creation has absolutely no impact on the Holy One whatsoever. Although, the Eternal One chooses to interact with the created beings by His own will. If you could destroy everything that exists, if you could set off all the world's nukes, all the world's weapons, if you could destroy literally the planet, the planets, the stars, if you could destroy everything that exists, Ein Sof would remain completely untouched. It would not have the least bit of influence. But, if you could destroy the Creator, then nothing else would remain. We would return to the state of void and there would be nothing. Therefore, anything one might say about Ein Sof is, at best, only partially correct. Ein Sof is utterly transcendent no thing. The nature of the God of the universe is no thing because the nature of Hashem transcends everything. That utterly transcendent being out of an attribute that we think of as love chooses to give us allegories and ways of conceiving that which is completely beyond us. Adam Cadman or independent existence is called forth by the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, by the words of the Torah, and by Elohim that arise ultimately from Ein Sof. So here you're looking at another system of Jewish mysticism. This word, Elohim Amar Haya, is the conceivable source. From this conceivable source, it is understood that the utterance of the sacred language draws forth from the emanations, these ten emanations, as one draws water from a well. Each individual Hebrew letter, therefore, possesses an intrinsic existence arising from and ultimately returning to Ein Sof. The Hebrew alphabet, therefore, contains and manifests his Torah for all of creation. Hebrew, therefore, is the most exalted of all languages, and it will, in the Olam Haba, or the future Messianic age, be the language of all of creation. 
Each Hebrew letter, likewise, has a numeric value that can, for those with understanding, further reveal the divine wisdom. Because light and color are definable through numeric sequences, they also are manifested sacred attributes that can reveal deeper understanding. So this is the foundation of Jewish mysticism. Through the emanations, Ein Sof surrounds and indwells each of us at every moment, at all times, and yet remains eternally distinct. This is very important stuff to understand, and this is very complicated, but it is directly related to the counting of the Omer. Because as we count the Omer, we are looking at seven spiritual emotional attributes that each one of us possess. And as we go through the process of the counting, we're trying to purify, we're trying to elevate ourselves in those particular realms. This mystical teaching is what I will be sharing each night during the counting of the Omer, Bezrat Hashem. To do this, I'm going to rely on a source that most of the Orthodox and even many non-Orthodox websites are looking into for the same purpose. It's the work of Rabbi Simon Jacobson. Rabbi Simon Jacobson is the rabbi at MeaningfulLife.com. MeaningfulLife.com. His daily Omer meditation is a major hit with people throughout the Jewish movement because it takes each night of the count and gives us a spiritual focus to look at, to purify ourself. And that is the source that I'm going to be using again this year for my uh, counting of the Omer meditations. These meditations will be posted each night right around sunset on my Facebook page. On the Shabbatot, on the Shabbat, Sabbath, I will be posting, obviously, before the, um, before the Sabbath begins. On nights like tonight, which is the second day of Pesach, uh, Hoover and I are going to go to the local congregation for the second uh, night Seder. And so, again, tonight I'll be posting this earlier. But wherever you live at, you want to count the Omer after sunset to do it properly. Those who live to the east of here, who live in Africa, who live in Israel, those places, you probably will already be well into darkness before I, well, you will, before I post the Omer. Those of you to the west of us, like in California where I used to live, when I'm posting it, it'll still be about three hours from dark, usually there. So count the Omer after it gets dark in your area. Um, Rabbi Simon Jacobson does an excellent job of presenting the purpose and the meditations related to the counting of the Omer. So each night I'm going to post the count as well as his meditation. Rabbi Jacobson writes, With the mitzvah of counting the 49 days, known as Sifirat HaOmer, the Torah invites us on a journey into the human psyche, into the soul. There are seven basic emotions that make the spectrum of human experience. At the root of all forms of enslavement, is a distortion of these emotions. Okay, my thought, but I think it's a good example of what he's talking about. You can fall in love with somebody, and love is a beautiful virtue, but your love can drive you to jealousy. Your love could drive you to murder someone if you were jealous of them. Those obviously are not positive things. So if you have any form of enslavement in your life, if you have any form of addiction in your life, if you have any form of unseen sin that you're trying to beat and you just can't beat it in your life, the root problem, according to Rabbi Jacobson, and I would agree, can be found in the seven emotional attributes. During the counting of the Omer, that is a wonderful time to work on these seven levels of your own consciousness, of your own emotional existence, to find purity. Each of the seven weeks, he continues, between Pesach uh, Passover and Shavuot is dedicated to examining and refining one of these. 
These are the seven emotional attributes that you'll be dealing with. Number one is chesed. And you'll find these also on the Tree of Life, by the way. Chesed is loving kindness. Gevorah is justice and discipline. Tiferet is harmony and compassion. Netzach is endurance. Hod is humility. Yeshod is bonding. And Malkut is sovereignty and leadership. There are very good reasons, mystically speaking, why we have seven emotional attributes and yet we have ten separate on the tree. <coughs> I'm not going to go into that right now, but I just want you to know there is a very good reason for it. And these seven are not in exclusion of the ten because these seven are the first seven of the tree. And so all of this is related. The rabbi continues, the seven weeks, which represent these emotional attributes, further divide into seven days, making up the 79 days of the counting. Since a fully functional emotion is multidimensional, it includes within itself a blend of all seven attributes. Thus, the counting of the first week, which begins on the second night of Pesach, as well as consisting of the actual counting, in other words, we say, today is day one of the Omer, would consist of the following structure with the suggested meditations that Rabbi Jacobson gives to you. And those are the ones that I'll be sharing as this period goes on. I'll also be pulling from other rabbinic sources and from other thoughts that I have on these meditations, but this is going to be the foundation of what I'll be posting um, for the next 49 days, Bezrat Hashem, on my Facebook account around sunset Eastern Standard, Eastern Time. Upon the completion of the 49 days, we will arrive at the 50th day, Matan Torah, the gift of the Torah. After we have achieved all that we can accomplish through our own initiatives, traversing and refining every emotional corner of our psyche, and that's what we do as we go through these days. We will then be qualified or worthy because of Hashem's granting it to us of a gift or a matan in Hebrew from above. Externally, we received the Torah on Shavuot. Inwardly, if we are purifying ourselves, we receive the gift of the Torah, of the insights of the Torah, of the love of Torah, of the corrections and the directions of the Torah. Continued, we receive that which we could not achieve with our own limited faculties. We receive the gift of true freedom, the ability to transcend our human limitations and touch the divine. You notice the rabbi says, and touch the divine, not become the divine. Again, Jewish mysticism does not include this concept of Tatsvama Si. We never will become Hashem, God forbid, even the thought of such a, of a terrible thought. Um, but the Sadakim are able to reach out and actually touch the divine nature because they have purified the seven aspects of themselves. They have climbed through the tree and they have attained harmony with Hashem. Such a person can say that they are one with Hashem in that sense. But no one ever becomes Hashem, God forbid. I want to make that really, really clear. We are eternally the servants of Hashem. So beginning tonight, as we go through these, you'll be reading on my site, for instance, week one, Hesed, loving kindness. Day one, Hesed of Hesed. In other words, loving kindness in loving kindness. And then there'll be a meditation for that. And then on day two, you'll have Gevorah in Hesed and a meditation on that. So this is the mechanics of how I'll be sharing this wisdom with you. Each night, each evening, as you read these things, think about how these things impact me, my life. Am I showing loving kindness? Am I showing compassion? Am I showing the right attitudes? Am I truly dedicating myself to Hashem? as I should be. 
and to my fellow man as I should be. Through such meditations, it is possible to achieve harmony with Hashem. And the counting of the Omer is the perfect time to do that. There's also various rules that go along with this period that apply only to Jews that I'm not going to get into right now. And toward, as we go down through this day, there is a wonderful, wonderful festival called Lagba Omer. And on Lagba Omer, uh, we have giant bonfires, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful time to be Jewish. Uh, we'll be talking about Lagba Omer and some of the other things as we continue on. But we'll be starting tonight, as I'm posting this, with... Uh, Hesed of Hesed. I hope you'll join me every night. Um, and again, remember that the rabbis do say that you don't want to miss a night of the count. If you do miss a night of the count, you don't want to recite the blessings anymore. So let that be an encouragement to you to actually do the count every single night. If my website can or my Facebook page can help you do that, I'm honored, truly honored to assist you in that. Um, you can also go to the, um, like, well, I, I, I'm an Android user, so you could go to Google Play, but you could also do it on Windows or whatever. And you can search for um, Omer Counting Reminders. Chabad has one, Aish has one, I think. And they'll give you updates on your phone. There's an app for that uh, <laughs> to remind you, and they'll give you insights and that kind of thing as well. But however you do it, if you're Jewish, I really encourage you to count the Omer. Um, if you're not Jewish, to my knowledge, there's no reason why you shouldn't count the Omer. And you certainly can apply this wisdom that Rabbi Jacobson will be sharing um, with in your life to make your walk with Hashem even better. Whether you're Noahide or whether you belong to another religion like Christianity or what have you, if you are a person who loves Hashem, this period of time is a time for you to grow closer and closer to Hashem. As always, if you have any questions, if you have comments, I invite you to, um, I invite you to let me know as a, uh, as a PM or in some other fashion. Let me know, and I'll be more than happy to answer as I can. And if I can't answer, I've got people I can refer you to who can. So if there's no more questions or comments, may God bless you, may God keep you, and may God cause his face to shine ever upon you. Um, I'm going to end this with a um, with a video with the same music that I began it with. Uh, Taste the light of love. Um, when we think of Ein Sof, we think of the light, the Or Hadash, coming down into the void, and the ten emanations of that coming outward. All of this is based on a concept of light, the light the Or Hadash. And so we can taste the light of love. And as we go through the meditations and purify ourselves and draw closer to Hashem, I hope you will all taste the light of love. And uh, so I thought this would be an appropriate song to share with you as we begin counting the Omer. Taste the light of love. Hope you enjoy.
natural traits are God's creation. It is the land of love. When connected to the sadi, it is the land of love. Learning Torah for its own sake. May God bless you and keep you, and may he cause his face ever to shine upon you, now and forever.